So now I want to talk about um, the Cosmic Background Explorer and the uh, science that went into that. Uh, in uh, 1974, I had just gotten out of graduate school, uh, NASA was looking for proposals for new satellite missions. It was five years after the moon landing. I said to my boss, um, well, my thesis experiment didn't work out very well, but what if we could have done it in outer space? So he said, yes, uh, we should do that and see if we can propose this. And uh, remarkably enough, uh, we kept on winning the competitions, which not, was not what I expected. Um, but anyway, here is the spacecraft that eventually flew. It was launched 15 years later, operated for four plus years, uh, and made amazing measurements. Yeah, there are instruments here to measure the microwave background from the Big Bang and uh, to also look for infrared light that might have come from the most distant galaxies. So this went up, um, let's see, um, 21 years and two days ago. It was a uh, re really quite remarkable thing to witness the launch and realize that the life work of many hundreds of people was standing on a pile of hundreds of thousands of pounds of explosive material. Um, but it went up and it worked. And uh, a few weeks later, we were able to give out our first scientific result. This is a very famous chart. Um, this is... Uh, the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background radiation, the primeval heat. We've got, it says, we didn't actually use a prism, uh, but it's as though you could spread out the sunlight with a prism and see how bright is every color. So this is what this is. The theoretical prediction of the Big Bang Theory is the smooth curve. And you see every data point lies right on it. When I showed this to the Astronomical Society, we got a standing ovation. And uh, from what I hear, it's the only one that's ever happened, practically, <laughs> uh, for a scientific result. So um, what it means is, basically, the Big Bang is a safe theory. And despite uh, very many difficulties and contradictory measurements and uh, some bad measurements, some bad theories to explain some bad measurements, uh, it came out OK. So people were very relieved. Uh, and now we know that the error bars are extremely tiny. They're 50 parts per million on this chart, which means this is the most precise measurement of this sort ever done. And the Big Bang still explains it. So that was cool. A um, couple of years later, uh, we published these, this uh, cover of Physics Today magazine, and Stephen Hawking said this one is the most important scientific discovery of the century, if not of all time. Uh, I thought, well, that's very nice, but it's probably not quite true. Um, but what it is, this is, I'll focus on this one. This is the map of the cosmos. This is the map of the inside of the Big Bang, as seen from here. So this is taking the entire sky... Uh, all around us, it looks spherical to us, but flatten it out onto a map, as you would the map of the Earth. And these are hot and cold spots of the Big Bang. So uh, it turns out these are the, also the uh, less dense or more dense regions of the Big Bang material. So uh, the more dense ones are the darker ones, it turns out, the aqua colored. Those are going to turn out to be, eventually, they'll grow up into clouds of galaxies. And the pink regions are going to grow up to be empty, no galaxies. So the, this is now... And the reason that we think we understand how we come we can exist, uh, that this is the process that the, universe, the Big Bang did in order to have us be here. Of course, it, wasn't, it didn't know it was making us. But um, other people have different opinions about the meaning of these things. But nevertheless, this is one of the reasons that so many uh, people have been so excited about this result. Uh, we wouldn't exist if it were not for those spots. So uh, there's a lot to say about that. Uh, there have been more scientific papers written about this, this map and its successors than there are spots on the map. So uh, it took uh, another few years uh, to get to the Nobel Prize. Uh, and this is what the uh, Swedish Academy of Sciences said uh, for our discovery of the black body form. And that's the spectrum with uh, boxes on this curve. And the anisotropy. And that's Greek, and it means not the same in every direction. So that means the, spot, the universe has pimples. So um, we got to go to Stockholm. I showed my chart a lot of times. Um, I got to get my diploma from the king and eventually a nice little check, which uh, my wife and I are, have put into a uh, foundation for science and the arts. So, however, there's more to come. 
Uh, there's a lot of mysterious uh, stuff in the sky, and so I love this cartoon from the... I didn't even have to write the caption. It came out like this in The New Yorker. So uh, everything is wrong, of course, from time to time. It's one of the great pleasures of science. It's a kind of wonderful surprise. The public doesn't seem to understand how often this happens <laughs> and why science is so much fun for us or possibly important for them. But anyway, um, here's one of the surprises. This is the uh, acceleration that I mentioned. Uh, what the Five billion years ago, this universe starts going faster and faster. This is from 1998, I think. Uh, here's Einstein's universe expanding. Here are three gentlemen, quite young looking, who are receiving the Shaw Prize in, uh, in Hong Kong, which is called the Asian Nobel Prize. So um, they're getting their prize for discovering this acceleration. Uh, most of them that had been working on this had been measuring supernovae, and they were expecting to discover that they were going to measure the density of the universe because the universe is slowing down because of the gravitational force. They were really surprised when this turned out to not be true. And it's a pretty substantial effect. The distant stars are 20% too faint, and now that's a big effect. So now I want to talk about the coming telescope and the mysteries that astronomers face and why we're going to build a new telescope the way we are. Um, a few big mysteries. Uh, what about the antimatter? Where is it? Why are there no antimatter galaxies? Um, what is the dark matter? I didn't tell you about dark matter, but most of the spots on that microwave map are due to something called dark matter. It's a uh, material which we astronomers are sure exists. It has gravitational force but it doesn't do anything else that we know of. It has gravitational force. It distorts the light beams as they go past galaxies. It makes the Milky Way not orbit the same way that we thought it would. Uh, it means the typical objects are many times more massive than they should be if you count up all the stuff that's in them. So this is a tremendous mystery, and we astronomers are the only ones to know so far. People believe and hope that the Hadron Collider will be able to make some dark matter. But, uh, so far, not yet. The dark energy, what is this stuff that makes the universe accelerate? It might yet not even be a stuff. Um, the name, giving it a name is already more than we really know about that. Uh, so we shouldn't do that. Everybody wants to know, how about Einstein? Is he really right? Uh, and he's awfully good, but not necessarily complete. So uh, how did we get here? This is our personal history. Uh, that's one of the, I think, the reasons that so many people love science and cosmology, because they begin to tell us about this. And of course, then a very interesting question, where are the others? Are we alone? And uh, we're working pretty well on that. So um, now I want to show you the uh, reasons for building a telescope that's different from what we've had before. Um, we uh, study with the Hubble telescope, we study visible light and a little bit of ultraviolet and a little bit of infrared. Um, but the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is actually transparent for visible light, so you can even do some of this work from the ground, and we do. Uh, this graph shows you that uh, most radiation from the universe does not come through the atmosphere, so we need to build a telescope in, in space. And in particular, infrared does not come through the atmosphere very well. Uh, if it did, we wouldn't be warm enough. Uh, greenhouse gases wouldn't be working. And so, uh, anyway, you can't see through the atmosphere very well with infrared. Uh, but it tells us interesting things. People look different with infrared light uh, because basically this is come, it represents the temperature of the objects. So um, we can feel it, we can't see it. And so and what it means is there's this huge uh, scientific opportunity if we can get the technology together to, um, to observe new things in the distant universe. So I'll show you the telescope and uh, what we hope to see with it. Uh, this is the telescope as it's drawn by the artists. Uh, and it lo looks more like a uh, solar energy concentrator in outer space. So it is, it's a uh, galaxy energy concentrator. Light comes from over here bounces off the parabolic mirror made out of pieces, focuses in on a smaller mirror and bounces into the instrument package there. So uh, this is the sort of quick summary of how it works. Um, uh, tell you a little bit about the project. Uh, NASA is leading the project. It's an international partnership with Europe and Canada. Uh, the place where I work in Greenbelt is the lead organization uh, for it, and we have our prime contractor at Northrop Grumman uh, near LA airport. So the telescope will have four instruments to take pictures and make spectra, and, uh, and will be operated like the Hubble telescope from Baltimore at the Institute up there. Now, a few words about this. This is enormous. This is uh, six and a half meters, or about 21 feet across, which is a lot bigger than the rocket. And that's not even counting this sun shield, which is as big as a tennis court. 
So uh, the sun and the earth are down here. I'll show you how we do that. Uh, and so they do not warm up the telescope. The telescope will be cold down to about 40 degrees Kelvin, which is to say really cold. Um, and uh, let's see. So it's cold. That, that enables us to do the infrared astronomy that we want because a telescope doesn't glow. Here's the orbit we send it to. Um, this is an exaggerated version, but there's the sun, there's the earth, and there are five points called Lagrange points uh, where the sun and earth gravity combine to help or make the object go around the sun once a year. So um, we choose this one, it's Lagrange point number two. It's a little farther from the sun than we are, but the earth is helping. So it keeps the, the payload uh, going around the sun with us. So this is actually about a million miles from there to there, and we're outside the orbit of the moon. Uh, and this is just a good place to be. It's the, because we can always see the telescope, always talk to it. It's not very far away, uh, and we can get all the commands and the data. So how, now I'll show you what it looked like on the National Mall. Here's a, uh, a steel model of the telescope. A uh, little different from the real one, but gives you some sense of scale. It's enormous. Um, here it is over in Germany at the Science Museum in Munich uh, in front of the old observatory dome, and I think it's a really wonderful uh, uh, sort of contrast. Uh, and, and people come from everywhere to see the telescope and just appreciate astronomy, and it's a great thing. The company made the model, by the way, because they want to sell more telescopes to other government agencies, among other things. Uh, people have other uses for this technology. We had to develop some uh, pretty surprising technologies for this telescope, and so these are basically inventions which we had to complete before we could uh, learn how to do this. Uh, one is that we had to make the mirrors. They're made out of beryllium, uh, element number four. Uh, we had to learn how to polish them so they will be the right shape when they're cold. Uh, we had to learn from the Hubble telescope how to focus. <laughs> if you remember, we didn't have a good time with that for a while. Um, Anyway, we learned the math from the Hubble telescope, and now we use it as this central control system for the telescope mirrors. Because we launched this thing, these are, these are folded up. It's not like that when it's launched. And each of these uh, 18 pieces has motors on it to adjust it to the right place and curvature. So now we can tell if it's focused, and we can actually control it. So that's what enables this huge increase in diameter over the Hubble. Um, and we had to do uh, other things that are also new uh, detectors and mic micro stuff. So I just want to show you a picture of the test bed telescope uh, that we used to practice. This is the telescope to practice focusing. And so we, we did it. It uh, actually works quite well. And we learned a few things that you never would have observed, never ha would have learned from a computer simulation. We have uh, four instruments that are going up. They're actually coming along quite well. We, there's our engineering drawings. Uh, but uh, the real things are going to be arriving at Goddard next summer. So uh, I'm not going to tell you how they work, but they're just uh, uh, wonderful achievements of uh, international partners as well as ourselves. Here is the test chamber down in Houston where we're going to put the telescope in and get it cold. This is what they could not do for the Hubble telescope. They could not focus the telescope on a target uh, before launch. Um, they ran out of money, and they said it was too expensive. Um, well, we're actually in danger of that, too. And if you read the news, you'll see uh, Senator Mikulski has chastised NASA for uh, uh, costing too much on this subject. But at any rate, I hope you'll use your uh, uh, political influence, whatever it might be, to help us with this. Anyway, here's the telescope looking up, up at the, at the uh, test equipment up here at the top. This happens to be the same test chamber that was re used for rehearsing for the Apollo. And it's actually uh, called Chamber A, and it's on the historic register. So when you want to change it and put uh, cooling stuff in it, you have to go through a little documentation. <laughs> cool, huh? Now, a few examples of things people were anticipating to see in the sky. Um, one thing that we didn't know would be possible, and at, the, at least at the beginning, of, is that nature has given us additional telescope lenses to use out there in the sky. Now, uh, when Einstein said gravitation can bend light, so sure enough, if you have enough gravitation due to this huge cloud of galaxies, they can actually focus the light. Not very neatly, but they can focus the light. So here is another galaxy that's way, way, way farther, and its light has been focused and distorted, but made bigger. So here is this uh, very far away galaxy 
made much larger. It's about 30 times magnification. So that's a big help. So there are a few things that just happen to be lined up perfectly so you can do this. Um, that's very interesting for us.